Okay, so if you recall in the last video, we defined the derivative of a function f at a point, you know, t equals t0 as f prime of t0, right? Where this is the derivative of f at t0 is equal to the limit as delta t goes to 0 of f of t0 plus delta t minus f of t divided by delta t. Right, so this was the change in f at the limit. Change in f over the change, right? This is our average rate. And we're taking the limit of that average rate of change as the time interval that we're considering the average over gets smaller and smaller. Okay, and so this was our definition that we just kind of introduced. But in order to make sense of this, we need to understand what is a limit. Okay, right, so that's kind of the topic of this. Let's start with an example. Okay, so in this example, we'll consider our classic population growth, p of t is equal to 2 to t. Right, we've done this 100 times now, where population is in millions of cells, t is in hours, right, and we computed the average rate of change of this. Um, and let's look near t equals 1, right, let's look at intervals, you know, let's look between t equals 1 and t equals 1 plus delta t. Okay, so delta t will change. But, you know, our interval will be looking around 1. We'll be looking forward in time delta t and seeing what the average rate is. Okay. The average rate of change between these two times is, uh, let's call it f of delta t. This will be at 1 plus delta t minus t 1 over delta t. Right, so if we plug in our function, this is 2 to the 1 plus delta t minus 2 to the 1 all over delta t. Right? So we can think of this function, right, we can think of this average rate of change as a function f, which is defined for all delta t's except at delta t equals 0. Right? Because at delta t equals 0, this becomes 2 to the 1 minus 2 to the 1. 0, 0, which gives me 2 to the 1 minus 0, which gives me 0 over 0, which according to the book is a mathematical felony, right? This is undefined. Can't divide 0 by 0. It doesn't make sense. Okay? So instead, you know, if we plot this function of delta t, right, this is for our average rate of change near t 1 as a function of that time interval that we're considering. Right, we can plot this function here in red, where uh, in red we have f of delta t is this 2 to the 1 plus delta t minus 2 over delta t. Right, so this is our function now for the average rate of change of our population function. On the x-axis we'll have our delta t. Right, and so this function is defined everywhere except we have a nice big hole where we are undefined at delta t equals zero. Okay. And so, you know, what the question is, you know, what is the function value at delta t equals zero, right? It's undefined there. So what value should it be, right? What value does it approach? What is the limit of this function, right? As delta t goes to zero. Okay. That's kind of the, the question, right? And so before we made these nice big tables, where we said, okay, let's compute, you know, I'm going to have to my lines here, right? Lines back in. Sorry, they're a bit messy. Okay, so here we showed, this is similar to what we were doing last time. We're computing the average rate of change for smaller and smaller intervals time, delta t. So uh, at, you know, big time interval would be interval 1, so then 1 plus delta t is 2. Population at that new time is 4. The change in population compared to population at time 1 is So the average growth rate between times 1 and time 1 plus 1, which is 2, gives us 2 million cells per hour as our average rate over that big interval. Right? If we want to know what the, the rate of change is at time 1, we have to make that interval smaller and smaller. So we look at half. So then 1 plus a half would give us 1.5, would be our time interval that we're looking at. We get the value of our function there, calculate the change in our function value, calculate the rate, 
average rate of change over this interval, which is length 0.5, right? And then as we decrease, right, we decrease the size of our time interval, right? These average rate of changes should approach the instantaneous rate of change. Of change. Okay. And so, you know, before this point, we say, okay, let's look at this list of numbers. Okay. And we say, okay, oops. Okay. Uh, we say, okay, by examining sequence, right? The sequence here of average rates of change values. We guess, you know, hey, the limit of, you know, this average rate of change is delta p over delta t. As delta t goes to zero, well, it looks like it's going to 1.38. And so we just guess a number like this, just by making a nice big table and then saying, hey, these values are sort of settling down at 1.386. Okay, since our values got closer. But closer and closer to 1.386 as delta t went to zero. Okay, so here our delta t is getting smaller, and our values of this rate of change, it's delta p over delta t, went to 1.386. Okay, so that's kind of a loose definition of the limit. But what does it really mean, right? What does closer and closer even mean? Right? What does it mean for a function to get closer and closer to some value as delta t goes to zero? Right? Let's think about this, you know, kind of from a different perspective. Let's think about kind of a scientific question. Right? If I had two quantities, right? Let's say I had two cups of water, and I wanted to know what is their temperature. Right? Well, I'd say that these temperatures are equal, or at least close in value, if they are too similar to distinguish with a precise measurement. Okay. Let's say I had a thermometer that only went up to one decimal place, right? And let's say that the actual temperatures of my cups of water were, let's say, 36.63 and 36.62. Let's say those were the actual temperatures of the water, but According to the thermometer, right, these are the same value with this thermometer. Okay, but if my thermometer went to two digits, right, then they wouldn't be the same. With a more precise thermometer, we'd be able to tell these two cups of water apart in temperature. Okay, so then I would say, okay, two quantities would be exactly the same, right? So these two temps would be the same if I took all the thermometers in the world, right? If I had, if, you know, every thermometer, no matter how precise, Couldn't distinguish them. Right? So if I had a thermometer that went to, you know, 50 decimal places and they were still the same up to that thermometer, then I'd say, okay, they're the same temperature. Right? So we're going to use this idea with the limit. Okay? Let's say we have this function. This is the same function we had before. I think this f of delta t is 2 to the 1 plus delta t minus 2 over delta t, which represented the average rate of change of our population over a time interval delta t. Okay, and we saw that this wasn't defined at 0, so we want to use a limit to kind of decide what should this value be of our function. Right, what is the limit of this function as we go to that undefined point? Okay, so, you know, let's say we were measuring this with some device. Right? And let's say the precision of our measuring device 
but you know within 0 0.01, right? So. Precision of the measuring device, right? Let's say it's 0 0.1, right? And then, you know, on the other side, it could be within 0 0.01 as well, 0 0.1, right? So let's say this is temperature, and we're measuring this with a thermometer, and our thermometer only tracks, you know, point up to one decimal place. So we can only measure within one decimal place of this function value here. Okay, well then if that was the case, then when we're making these delta t's, right, we're trying to approximate the value of this function there as a function of delta t, we only need to get within these boundaries, right, wherever this intersects the precision lines, right, right, this defines an interval wherein, you know, any delta t in here is the same value or the same measurement as this limit point, okay? Because the precision of our measuring device is, is not that great, right? And then if we had a more precise measuring device, right, let's say we could get within point zero zero one, right? Let's say that this precision was now point zero one, right? Well, now we have to be, our delta t has to be within this smaller range, right? Delta t must be within smaller interval in order for f of delta t to be same as this one. Okay, so then we'll define a limit by saying, okay, if we took all the measuring devices in the world, device with e, sorry, right? If we had an infinitely precise measuring device, then, you know, that would, you know, the function that we're measuring there would be, you know, within there. Okay, so, so more precisely, because I just butchered that, we say that the limit of our function, f of delta t, at, let's say, delta t equals zero, the limit is equal to some number l, if no matter how precise our measurements of f are, right, so no matter the precision of our measurements of f, we can always find a sufficiently small delta t, so that f of delta t is within the measurement accuracy of this limit l, okay? And if we can do that, no matter how precise our measurement is, then that means we can always pick this delta t to give us f within the, you know, our precision window, which means that our function is approaching this limit L, okay? So that's kind of our, our working definition here. All right, so let's do an example, because that might not have made a whole lot of sense. Let's say our function is f of x equals 3x plus 2x squared over x. Right now, this function is not defined at x equals zero, right, because if I plug in zero, right, f of zero gives me zero plus zero over zero, or zero over zero, which is undefined. Okay, the function can't be defined at x equals zero. But for x not equal to zero, right, I can simplify this, right? I can divide by zero because now I'm not, sorry, I can divide by x because I won't be dividing by zero. So I can simplify this to three plus two x. Right, because we can divide by x when x is not zero. Okay, so then if I plot this function, right, y equals f of x versus x, there's a hole, right, it's undefined at x equals zero. Okay, but we can still define the limit of this function at x equals zero. Okay, so, you know, to be within, you know, for f of x to be within, let's 
say 0 0.1 of y equals 3, right? So this is the precision of our measurement, right? In order for f to be within this precision of this limit value, right, we would need, okay, 2.9 is less than f of x is less than 3.1, right? So this is saying that f of x is within 0.1 of y equals 3. That's what this inequality means. Okay, so then let's, uh, you know, let's plug in our function, right? So 2.9 is less than 3 plus 2x is less than 3.1. Let's move the 3 to both sides. We'll subtract 3 everywhere. We subtract 3 over here. We get negative 0.1x, right? Since we subtracted the 3 off from here, we subtract the 3 off from there. We also get 0.1, okay? And now we'll divide by 2, negative 0.05 less than x, 0 0.05, okay? So in order for f of x to be within 0.1 of y equals 3, x must be within 0 0.05 of x equals, okay? So what does that mean, right? If I go to my function graph over here, to be within 0.1 of this limit, say this is my right this is 0 0.1 down here is another 0 0.1 right in order to be within this range right within this precision of my limit point my function needs to have an input between 0 0.05 and 0 0.0 okay, negative 0 0.05 and 0 0.0 right so that's the algebra that we just did translates into finding these x coordinates of where these precision lines intersect our function. Okay? And then let's say we wanted to be even more precise, right? Let's say, you know, for f of x to be within 0 0.01 of y equals 3, right? We would need 2.99. Right now that's within 0 0.01 of y equals 3. Or 3.01. Okay, so these are the precision kind of uh, intervals, right? So then we'll plug in our function 2.9 is less than plus 2x. 1, subtract off 3, so this gives us negative 0 0.01. 2x, 0 0.01. Divide by 2, we get negative 0 0.005 is less than x is less than 5. So in order for x, f of x to be within 0 0.01 of y equals 3, x must be within 0 0.005 x equals 3. Okay, and we can always play this game, right? No matter how close to y equals 3 we look, right? This is our precision, so we looked at 0.1 close, we looked at 0 0.01 close. No matter how close to this value we look, we can always find an x interval, okay? So here we found x must be within 0.05. Here we found x must be within 0.005, right? We can always find this x interval that guarantees that our function is that close to y equals 3, okay? So what this implies is then, since we can always do this, right, no matter how precisely we look, we can always find an input that gives our, you know, makes our function close enough to that value. So what that means is that the limit as x goes to 0 of this function f of x is equal to 3, right? Because no matter how close we look to 3, we can always find an x that's close enough to 0 that guarantees that f is close to 3. And so that, that's kind of the definition of the limit. And going forward, we're not going to really compute limits like this, but this is just kind of how to understand the idea of limits. So in the next video, we'll show how to actually compute them. And for, you know, simple enough functions, they're actually pretty straightforward to evaluate by. All right.